This is lecture number six on Kings by Dr. Robert Vinoy of Biblical Theological Seminary. Lecture number six. So, number one under capital F was peace with a flaw, and that's 1 Kings chapter 9, verses 10 to 25. You recall what we discussed there in 1 Kings chapter 9, verses 10 to 25, is the act of Solomon in giving these 20 cities to Hiram, who was king of Tyre. The question that raises is, which we discussed in the last hour, does he really have any right to take part of the promised land that belongs to the tribe of Asher, you might say in a technical sense, but which ultimately didn't belong either to Solomon or to Asher, but which belonged to the Lord? It was the Lord's land. Did he have any right to take that land and give it to a heathen king as collateral for a loan? That is basically what he did. When you go back to the Sinai Covenant, it emphasizes over and over that the land really belongs to the Lord. The Israelites lived there and worked there, but they could not just do with the land whatever they pleased. In fact, there was the concern that the land not even be sold out of the family line so that the family line that was within a tribe could keep its inheritance. It's not Israel or Solomon or ultimately anyone that owned the land in the ultimate sense of the word. It was the Lord's land. I think seen in that perspective, Solomon does something that is really not proper for the true covenantal king to do, to give away some of that land to a heathen king. So I think that even in that act, you have an indication that this kingdom of peace is flawed. It's not perfect. It's not what it ought to be. It's only provisional. It's not the final realization of the kingdom of peace, and as long as that ultimate kingdom of peace, which I think scripture tells us one day will come and will be established, but as long as that is not here, then there are going to be forced relocations of people, evictions of people, people compelled to give up their residences, things of that sort, and history is certainly full of that. You have that at this point in Israel towns being given over to a heathen ruler. You have that in recent Israeli history as well, but I don't want to get into that. You can take that peace principle involved there and apply it in present time to the church where God's people are not organized as a political entity with geographical territorial rights or anything of that sort. I think you can have the same principle in a sense that in the church, even in the Church of Christ, where in a certain sense the peace of Christ is present, and where it rules and reigns certainly in the hearts of believers, and where it should reign and rule in relationships between believers, you find also that even there there are flaws and cracks. The church is not perfect, nor are the people in it. To some people, that becomes so much of a stumbling block that they become disillusioned with church. And some people go even as far as not to want anything to do with the church because it's not perfect. It's full of hypocrites, they say. I think what you have to understand is that as long as sin still exists, whether you're in the Old Testament period or in the New Testament period or at present, you don't have the perfect kingdom and peace in its completeness and wholeness is not present. It has not yet arrived, and it's not here yet in its fullness. So I think there is a balance needed as far as perspective for that kind of thing. I think you have to guard against idealistic expectations. In other words, we could wish and hope that everything were perfect here in this life and at this time, and people who lived in Solomon's time wished that kingdom was perfect. But it's not going to be perfect. We should have idealist expectations to expect it to be perfect. That's one side of the coin. The other side is that we shouldn't become so cynical that evil things we see in the church or in society are simply accepted as things that we can't do anything about. You sort of just ignore things because you realize things aren't perfect, and therefore, when you see problems, when you see things that aren't right, you just tolerate it, or again, as I said, just become cynical and ignore it. You don't want to become cynical about things. I think that latter position expects too little of the power of Christ and of his Holy Spirit. You can address problems. You can work for improvement, and there can be substantial improvement in situations. It's never going to be perfect, but there can be a measure of that. 
The idealistic thing that always looks for perfection doesn't take sufficient account of the fallen nature of man. I think you have to hold both these things in balance and perspective. And a Christian should have hope and expectation that in spite of sin, Christ is at work in the world and things can be accomplished for good and we should work as much as we can to bring that about. One should not be totally disillusioned when the results are not complete and final because they won't be until Christ himself comes and establishes that perfect kingdom of peace that Solomon didn't do and which nobody else has done or will do until Christ returns. Now, we're in this section that runs from verses 10 through 25, and we're speaking of peace with a flaw. Verses 15 and 16 give us almost a reverse situation. You read there, and again we're in chapter 9, and I quote, Here is the account of the forced labor King Solomon conscripted to build the Lord's temple, his own palace, the supporting terraces, the walls of Jerusalem, Hatzor, Megiddo, and Gezer. End quote. And then you get a parenthetical statement in verse 16 after Gezer is mentioned, where it explains what Gezer is. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had attacked and captured Gezer, and he had set it on fire. He killed its Canaanite inhabitants and then gave it as a wedding gift to his daughter, Solomon's wife. Solomon rebuilt Gezer. He fortified it. I mentioned something about Gezer, I think, back in chapter 3. I believe that's chapter 3, verse 1, where it says Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. I think I made a comment at that point that along with that marriage alliance Solomon had received this town, Gezer. But you see, you have a reverse situation here. In the previous verses, Solomon gave away 20 cities. Here he receives one city. He gave away 20 cities to a heathen ruler. Now he receives a city, Gezer, from an Egyptian pharaoh. Gezer is also a city that belonged to the territory of the promised land that belonged to the tribe of Ephraim. Let me mention, however, before we move on, that this city of Gezer is a very important city out in the lowlands west of Jerusalem and is kind of a gateway into the whole area of Jerusalem in the hill country of Israel. And so it's a very important city, and Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is making quite a concession when he gives that city to Solomon. Even during the conquest, you read in Joshua chapter 10, verse 33, that Gezer was defeated. Joshua 10.33 says, and I quote, Meanwhile, Horam, king of Gezer, had come up to help Lachish, but Joshua defeated him and his army until no survivors were left, end quote. So Gezer had been defeated, but apparently the city wasn't destroyed and hadn't been settled or occupied by the Israelites. Apparently things remained that way from the time of the conquest up to the time of Solomon. The city remained a Canaanite city. Now, you might tend to think, because of current events, that the Palestinian problem, so-called, in Israel is a modern problem, a recent thing. But I think you can, on looking at the biblical text, say that Israel has almost always had a Palestinian problem in one form or another. It existed in the Old Testament period as well, because, just as today, Arabs and Palestinians live in Jerusalem and other parts of Israel, particularly the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, so in Solomon's days, there were Jebusites in Jerusalem, along with Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, and Hivites in various parts of the land. Non-Israelites were dwelling in the land of Israel, and there were cities and areas where hardly any Israelites lived. They were occupied by these other peoples, and Gezer was one such city. From the time of the conquest up until the time of Solomon, much of Israel was occupied by Canaanite inhabitants. So I think you can say there was a Palestinian problem at that time as well. Or you might say there was a Canaanite problem. That situation was also not just a political issue, of course, but had political implications. But at the core, and far more importantly, I think there was a religious issue involved because the Old Testament tells us the Canaanites who remained in the land would become a stumbling block to Israel and lead them astray, to follow their heathen worship and heathen practices. The idols of these people seem to have a strong attraction for the Israelites, and through the period of the judges you read repeatedly 
that Israel went astray after the religious practices of these Canaanites. So far greater than a political threat was the religious threat from the Canaanites. I think in Solomon's time, the political issue, as far as Gezer was concerned, was not that serious, but the religious aspect continued to be a threat, not just with Gezer, but with other pockets of Canaanite inhabitants that were settled in the land of Israel. Now, the only way to solve that was to do what the Lord had said when they entered into the land at the time of the conquest, and that was they were to destroy all of these Canaanites and all of these cities and their inhabitants. And if they didn't do that, then they would be led astray by their heathen religious practices. The interesting thing with Gezer is it was conquered and set on fire, and all its inhabitants were killed. But that wasn't done by Israelites. It was done by the Egyptian pharaoh that we read about in verse 16. So that action against Gezer had nothing to do with carrying out the command of the Lord to utilize this ban, as it's sometimes called, on the Canaanites. It was simply a military expedition by an Egyptian pharaoh, which was rather a common thing as these pharaohs marched up and down through the land of Canaan when they decided to do so. Undoubtedly, the booty that Pharaoh got from that city he took back with him to Egypt. The ruins were left behind, and he gives the ruins, strange as it might seem, as a dowry to his daughter when she marries Solomon. And so Solomon sets about, as we read in this verse, to rebuild the city and fortify it. I repeat again, Gezer is a very important city, so being given the ruins enables Solomon to rebuild it and to fortify it, and thereby fortify his western flank from Jerusalem. Now, the Queen of Sheba seems to be attracted by this as she visits Solomon. She was overwhelmed by what she saw and heard. So you read in verse 9 her statement. She says, Praise be to the Lord your God, who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. That's a good statement. It seems as she had good insight into the purpose of what kingship is. Notice what she says. He has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. Isn't that what a good king should do? Then you read, she gave the king 120 talents of gold, large quantities of spices, precious stones. It's often the case on state visits. There's an exchange of gifts, and the tradition still goes on today. But it's in this connection that you get some comment about Solomon's wealth. You read in verse 13, quote, Solomon gave the queen of Sheba all that she desired and asked for, besides what he had given her out of his royal bounty. Then she left and returned with her retinue to her own country, end quote. And then you read, quote, The weight of gold that Solomon received yearly was 666 talents, end quote. Now, in the NIV Study Bible, there's a text note there that says that is about 25 tons, not including the revenue from merchants and traders and from all the Arabian kings and governors of the land. What do you do with this gold? King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. 600 beccas of gold went into each shield. A becca is about seven and a half pounds. The king put them in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. Then the king made a great throne, inlaid with ivory, overlaid with fine gold. The throne had six steps. On its back, a rounded top. On both sides of the seats were armrests. I'll come back to that throne, but if you go down a little bit further to verse 21, we read that all King Solomon's goblets were gold. All the household articles in the palace of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Nothing was made of silver because silver was considered of little value in Solomon's day. End quote. Now, you see, in this context of this visit of the Queen of Sheba, you have these statements about Solomon's wealth. And I think in those statements you can perhaps see something of a turning point. I think the wealth of Solomon is viewed generally as evidence of God's blessing. It's not something that per se is wrong. It's not criticized. But I think the question comes with what does one do with such riches? How does one use it? Do you use them in a simple way, to honor God, to advance his kingdom, or do you use it for yourself? If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 17, to what we call the Law of the King, 
there are three things that a king of Israel was not to do. He was not to acquire great numbers of horses. We've already seen that Solomon did that. Second, he was not to take many wives, but Solomon did that. The third thing, he was not to accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Now, I want to come back to the first two things as we go further, because they are mentioned as we go further. But here's the third thing. He was not to accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. When you read verses 14 through 25, it's clear Solomon is doing exactly what the law of the king in Deuteronomy said he should not do. And I think when you look at what he is doing with the silver and the gold, you could say he's really not doing sensible things with his wealth. He makes 200 large and 300 small shields of gold to hang in his palace. It's decoration out of pure gold. All his goblets were gold. All his household articles were gold. Nothing was silver because it wasn't good enough for him. I think you might say these are maybe judgmental matters, period. But I think you might say for a king it might be appropriate to have a set of gold goblets for special occasions and something like that. But for ordinary household items, that seems to me to be a bit severe. It's all pure gold for everyday use. It seems like wealth is being used to build an image, to make an impression, to be like other kings of the ancient world with all their splendor of the court. Then you have the description of his throne that I said I wanted to come back to. We read he made this great throne inlaid with ivory, overlaid with fine gold. The throne had six steps. On its back was a rounded top. On both sides of the seat were armrests with a lion standing besides each one of them. Twelve lions stood on six steps, one at either end of each step. Nothing like it was ever seen for any other kingdom. End quote. It must have been quite a throne. It was elevated by six steps. So he sits high above his subjects. But the law of the king in Deuteronomy says the king was not to consider himself better than his brothers. So again, you wonder if Solomon's attitude here is not violating that requirement in Deuteronomy chapter 17, seeing that the throne suggests that he views himself above his people. There's an interesting textual variant with that phrase in verse 19, which is, the throne had six steps, its back had a rounded top. Where it says, its back had a rounded top, the Septuagint, that is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, says, the throne had a calf's head on its back. Okay, not a rounded top, but a calf's head. Now, it's not clear that that's to be the preferred reading. It's sometimes hard to know when you have differences between the Septuagint and the Hebrew text, which one contains the original preferred reading. But it's at least possible that here's an indication of a drift into idolatry in the creation of this throne. You know that when you get to chapter 11, the next chapter, verse 5, where you read that, quote, he followed Asheroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites, you know that at some point in Solomon's reign, he began to entertain ideas of worship of heathen deities. If he had a calf's head on his throne, that may be also some kind of symbol of idolatry that was incorporated right into his throne. That's not clear because it's based on a Septuagint reading, not the Hebrew reading of the Masoretic text, but it is a possibility. But in any case, I think when you go through this chapter and get this picture of the wealth and compare that to the statements of Deuteronomy chapter 17, which were to govern the conduct of the king of Israel, I think it's clear again that Solomon is not the true covenantal king. When you look for that ideal of the covenant king, you do not find it in Solomon. You really have to look elsewhere and into the future. I think ultimately you have to look to Christ. And, of course, Scripture speaks of a throne in Revelation chapter 22, verse 1, where you read, The angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, flowing down to the middle of the great street of the city. On either side of the river stood the tree of life. Solomon's throne was not the throne of the true king, the true king of peace. He fell short of that. But then our expectation has to go forward to the fulfillment of that ideal in Christ himself. I think the overall picture of Solomon's kingdom is a kingdom of peace because everyone could sit under their own vine and fig tree, as it says. There were no wars, and there was prosperity. 
And at least, early on in Solomon's reign, Solomon himself followed the Lord, and so it was a time of great blessing. But things began to change and deteriorate. Solomon did not come on the throne with great wealth all at once. He accumulated it in gradual processes, and then he accumulated all these wives. Again, a gradual process. Then eventually his wives turned his heart away from the Lord to heathen worship. So by the end of his reign, the Lord sends a prophet to say, I'm going to take the kingdom from you, and I'll only leave you one tribe. And that, of course, is Judah, and it turns out part of Benjamin. I think what you see is that Solomon is the initial son of David, and there is a picture of his reign and of his kingdom of peace, but it's an imperfect one and a flawed one. This makes us realize that ultimately we must look elsewhere for the complete realization of the perfect, peaceful kingdom, which, of course, will come when Jesus returns. What you find in Solomon is trying to combine the worship of the Lord with the worship of these heathen deities, and that is something that continued to exist in Israel and king after king after king. It's not all attributed to Solomon's fall, but the kinds of things that Solomon did was also done by many others down the line. This thing called syncretism, trying to combine worship of Yahweh with foreign gods, is right from the golden calf at Mount Sinai. They were trying to worship the Lord through the golden calf, and so there was syncretism even back then. That is the fundamental problem Israel had all through her history. Well, let's take a break, and then we'll come back with some more. That was lecture number six on Kings by Dr. Robert Vinoy of Biblical Theological Seminary.